Have you ever found yourself wondering, which game is better, Vampire the Masquerade or Vampire the Requiem? Well, today I am here to give you the definitive answers. There can be no more debate because I have solved this. I have decided for everyone, once and for all, which game is the better game. Uh, and the answer is Vampire the Requiem. Specifically, Blood and Smoke, the Strix Chronicle, or as it will soon be known, second edition of Vampire the Requiem. Uh, now I know some of you are going to be mad, you're going to make me, uh, you're going to have all sorts of, uh, you know, flame wars in the comments and whatnot, uh, and that's totally fine, you're entitled to your own wrong opinions, but uh, I'm going to tell you why this game is better than Vampire the Masquerade. Um, and I'm going to be doing a full review on this soon, but this is just kind of a, a side issue that I didn't want to kind of taint the, the review of this product specifically. Um, so a little background on myself, the very first uh, real role-playing game that I got into was Vampire the Masquerade when I was maybe 15 years old. Uh, one of my best friends to this day uh, got me into that game and it was a breath of fresh air because I remember when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I was trying to play uh, AD&D 2nd Edition and it didn't work for me. It was too complicated and I didn't have friends who were really, like, that into role-playing at the time uh, that we could uh, really get a good RPG experience out of it. Um, so at any rate, Masquerade blew my mind. It spoke to me so much. That gothic punk atmosphere, the, you know, the, the end is nigh, you know, uh, time of judgment coming on, the final nights, uh, the Sabbat and the Camarilla, the, the, uh, everything about that game really spoke to me at the time. And it's so awesome. It's still one of my favorite games to this day. So please don't take this as me saying that there's anything wrong with Masquerade, because there's not. I love that game. However, uh, as a storyteller, uh, and I've been a storyteller, GM, flame tender, whatever you want to call it, uh, my, pretty much my entire gaming life. Um, I've only played in a few games. I've, I've always been running games. Um, it's like 95% of my role-playing experience has been, uh, you know, in the driver's seat as the, as the GM. And uh, Masquerade's lore was really overbearing, and especially at the time that I started playing, uh, because that was right maybe a year or two before the Time of Judgment series of books got released. And I had, you know, 15 years worth of uh, revisions and lore and stories uh, and the week of nightmares and all of these things that, you know, I devoured so much of that lore and I knew all about it when I was in high school and I've forgotten almost all of it now. Um, but it was really overbearing and it was hard for me to tell my own stories within that game. Um, when Requiem got released, when the New World of Darkness was launched, I was very skeptical of it at first, but as soon as I read, uh, read the books, the, the, the blue book and the red book, uh, oh my god, I fell in love with that game. Um, because it is the type of game that gives you enough lore and enough inspiration, but leaves holes in the story uh, for you and ambiguity and allows you to fill in the gaps with your own creativity. And that is the, exactly the kind of setting that I like uh, in a game exactly the kind of story hooks that I like. Uh, and so that set my mind on fire. It was like I could do anything with that game. It was this great sandbox uh, to play in. And to this day, uh, that first Vampire the Requiem game that I, that I played in was the best game I've ever run, um, in my opinion. And, uh, but that game had its flaws. And I went back and forth on which game, you know, which game was better. And they both had their strengths. And for me, uh, in particular, the biggest strength of Requiem uh, was that I love the setting, first of all, but I did love the kind of sandbox approach that it gave you. Um, and I basically, I went back and forth on that until I got Blood and Smoke, until I found this revision. Um, now, I think I had, I always kind of liked the lore in, in Requiem better anyway, just because I liked a lot of the, you know, the the covenants and whatnot. Like, my favorite is uh, the Lankea Sanctum, or the Lankea et Sanctum, as they're now known. Uh, in second edition, um, they're basically the you know the the Catholic, 10th century Catholic Church through the eyes of Charles Manson. Um, you know it's this vampire cult like these Catholic vampires. They're ins it, it's so fucking scary and creepy, and there's so much you can do with that. And and having been raised Catholic, that was like oh this is twisted, and I love this. Uh, I I absolutely loved it. I loved the covenants. I loved the clans. Um, but that game mechanically was totally messed up. Uh, all of the physical disciplines, you know, uh, vigor, resilience, and celerity, uh, which would be potence, uh, fortitude, and celerity in, in Masquerade, were messed up. Uh, they, I don't know a single person who played that first edition and didn't have a house rule for every one of those disciplines. 
uh, or who didn't have a house rule for a mechanic known as Predator's Taint, uh, which is, in my opinion, it was a brilliant idea, but it was just poor, <laughs> really poorly executed in first edition. Um, so when I found out that uh, you know Requiem had this update, this this Chronicle book, uh, I was a little skeptical. I didn't really get it uh, until I got myself a, a PDF version, and I was blown away by it. And I finally was able to get myself. Uh, my my wife was was uh, wonderful and got me the physical copy of Blood and Smoke for my birthday um, this year, and uh, I have to say that this is for ever tipped the scales for me. Even with uh, Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition out, this has forever tipped the scales for me in terms of which game is better. Um, it maintains that uh, open-ended atmosphere uh, of horror, but it has taken this game that really was almost apologizing for itself. When Requiem came out, it was, it was apologizing that it wasn't Masquerade. And fans hated it when it came out. Um, I mean, the, a lot of people like me, I loved it. Uh, it was successful enough that, you know, they made books for it for like 10 years. Uh, or, you know, like 9 years, whatever it was. Um, but a lot of Old World of Darkness fans hated that game. Uh, because it wasn't Masquerade. And that really cause, well, kind of was the only reason for a lot of people. Uh, they just didn't want to see something new. Um, and so it did have a lot of, it shared a lot more DNA with Masquerade than this version does. Blood and Smoke is its own world that is now completely separate from Masquerade in terms of its kind of creative DNA. Um, and it is awesome. It is so much better for it. Uh, the simplification in, in Requiem from, uh, you know, 13 to, you know, 13 to, you know, 40 or 900 clans, however many clans there actually are in, in V20. Um, the simplification of that, getting it down to five vampire clans in Requiem was great. Um, however, going back and looking at that first edition, the, the splats on each one were kind of bland and boring in, in retrospect. The way they're described in Blood and Smoke, holy shit, uh, they're scary. Every one of them is creepy and scary, and you want to play every clan, and they give you reasons why you want to play this clan. You know, uh, how, why this? Why other people should fear this clan? Why you should fear yourself? Um, the the clan weaknesses have been reworked uh, completely. They're a lot more interesting. Everything in this game is uh, dedicated towards telling a better story and get and making it more personal. And this is the biggest difference between Vampire the Masquerade and Vampire the Requiem. Uh, besides, besides the you know the focus on meta plot and, uh, or or sandbox, uh, you know. That's a big difference, but the biggest difference of each game has always been the focus of the game. And Vampire the Masquerade is very much, um, it is a fantasy game. It's fantasy. Uh, it is fantasy horror, and I love it. It's, a, it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Do not take this as me saying that makes it less than Requiem. No, 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 not at all. Uh, the focus of the game, though, in, uh, in Vampire the Masquerade, as it is presented to you, is that this is a fantasy horror game in a Judeo-Christian nightmare world. And it does that, it just absolutely does that so perfectly. Vampire the Requiem, though, is far, far more, more focused. Uh, on, or not focused, but, but it's like taking this huge world you have and then looking at it under a microscope. That's what Requiem does. Instead of having these globe-spanning uh, conspiracies uh, like, like Masquerade had, uh, Requiem makes everything local. Um, cities are disconnected from one another in terms of kindred politics. Uh, you know, having pull in one city doesn't mean shit going somewhere else. Uh, you know, you may have pull in your organization, your, you know, the covenant you're in. You may be a bishop in the Lenkei Sanctum, but if you go to a new city, you are in comp it's like going to a different planet, uh, pretty much. Uh, so it's, it's very much more focused on the personal horror element. It's focused on uh, themes of like, like gothic corruption, corruption of the self, and uh, they've gone, I think, even farther with that in this version of the game. And uh, mechanically, this game is beautiful. I don't have, I don't, I haven't played the game yet, but uh, on paper, I don't see myself needing to do any house rules for this game. There may be, a, there's a couple of mechanics that I just won't use uh, that I think that I think are good mechanics, but. I don't really care. I, the less dice rolling I can do, uh, the, the better. 
Uh, but they've completely retooled the humanity system. Humanity in Requiem was really about uh, kind of moral degeneration. And these, it's like, you know, you commit a murder and that's a sin. And you, you're, you're becoming more and more just this like beast, like you're going to kill people, whatever. Uh, in, in Blood and Smoke, in this update, they've changed that though. There's a lot more ambiguity to things. And, um, which is great, which is always great. Ambiguity is great in storytelling. Uh, but they've made the humanity mechanic. It's not so much that you're just becoming this monster. You are becoming a monster and killing people and, and committing murders and things like that. That does cause you to have breaking points and to, and to lose humanity. But it's not that it's like, oh, you're just becoming more evil. You know, it's that you're becoming detached from, you're losing contact with what it means to be human. You, you're forgetting what that means. And as a result, the lower your humanity is, if whenever you try and interact with humans, that comes across mechanically. You're at a disadvantage when you're trying to interact with them. Uh, the lower your humanity goes, uh, the, the harder it becomes for you to communicate with them without totally creeping them out. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. It also, uh, your humanity and your blood potency uh, is what ties, is, is determines how much damage you take from fire and sunlight and in what interval, how quickly you take it, uh, which is, is brilliant. Um, and they have, th just the, the refocusing the clans, refocusing the covenants, uh, and focusing on the elements of personal horror and building that into the game mechanics is just awesome. Uh, they took kind of a nod from Wraith the Oblivion, the, the idea of the kind of passions and fetters uh, that they had in that game and translated it into the system called Touchstones. Uh, in Wraith, you know, your fetters were these objects that kept you tied uh, to reality, basically. They were um, items of great emotional, uh, items or places uh, of great emotional import to you that kept your soul, you know, tied to this world. Well, in Requiem, they've taken that and they've uh, created the touch Touchstone system, which is uh, touchstones are usually people, very rarely they can be a place or an object, uh, but they are uh, people, characters, uh, that keep you grounded. They're the person in your life that reminds you of that human experience. What It, it keeps you grounded. Uh, and so it's, it's the kind of thing, it's like it could be an ex-lover uh, or a rival or, um, you know, somebody, something... Basically, it can basically be anything, anything that reminds you of your own humanity. And it forces you to come up with basically a second, third, fourth, fifth character. Because you, you can, uh, through the merit system, have multiple touchstones. Uh, and this, it, it gives the storyteller ammunition to, height, to heighten the drama. And it gives you a deeper character right off the bat. Uh, and the, like I said, the focus is on these personal experiences. Uh, and that, for me, is more interesting than the kind of globe-spanning conspiracies and the end-of-the-world scenarios, uh, which are awesome and I love, but I love this that this game is, is, is a lot more local. Uh, it's a lot scarier, too, in my opinion, uh, because it is focused on these personal issues as opposed to being like, well, there's something that's going to fucking eat you. Uh, there are things that will eat you in this game, don't get me wrong. Uh, but this game, like, it is just absolutely brilliant in bringing storytelling into the mechanics itself, into the game, and the setting for this game, holy shit, they absolutely nailed it. Uh, the way, the word that keeps coming to my mind with this always is fast, and I don't know exactly why, but everything about this game is fast. Uh, just the the kind of emotional resonance it has, the uh, the the kind of the, the the sheer terror of this game. It's all it's fast. It's in your face. Uh, and it hits you on a gut level as opposed to um, being a little bit more abstract uh, and a little more, and in, in it's less conspiratorial. Um, this is a game, obviously, that is still focused a lot on uh, and shares creative DNA with, with Vampire the Masquerade. It's being very political. Um, vampires are, you know, lying sacks of shit that <laughs> are backstabbers and are inhuman monsters that want to, you know, kill and eat everybody. Um, and uh, they have really, really focused that. And that is what makes this a better game, in my opinion. Uh, once and for all, this is better than, than Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, because of the focus. Um, because they've refined the, the lore so well. Because it still has 
that open world, this this place you can go and create anything in it. Um, and they have way like they took vampire is is always uh, any in any vampire lore. It's usually, it's almost always got a large sexual element to it. Vampirism, in my opinion, is a sexual metaphor. Um, very easy to see that. I mean, the the vampiric act itself is a penetration of another of another body, transfer of bodily fluids. Uh, it's very sensual and and uh, and sexual, and that always translates in in most vampire media. Not all, but but a lot of it. And boy, oh boy, did they amp up the sex in this game! <laughs> Holy shit! Uh, they they didn't pull any punches with this. It is uh, it's a sexy game. It is very sexualized. A lot of the artwork, uh, which I will show you. Uh, couple of my favorite pieces in here um, is very very sexy and uh, is just it is just cool uh, and like I said I'm gonna do a full review on this game um, but to me it is a far more terrifying game um, let's see if you, can, you can see that one uh, it's a far more terrifying game on a number of levels uh, it is a uh, better game mechanically in every way. This this system is so much better uh, than certainly than Vampire Revised. Uh, V20 is very good, but this is this is better. That's all there is to it. Um, and they fixed every problem that that existed in that in first edition of Requiem. Uh, I still recommend anybody who wants to play Vampire the Requiem. Um, yeah, get Blood and Smoke because this is awesome. This is the definitive edition of Vampire the Requiem. But still, go back and look at. First edition, because I did, I do think a little bit of first edition got kind of lost in translation for this one. Um, the art style of the first game was unbelievably amazing. The 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 core book was so good, um, but the art style for this game, I guess, it's not that it's worse in any way. I I think it's brilliant. The art style for this game really, it's the you know, it it follows the the function. The form follows the function of this book. Um, there has been a big shift in tone in this game, and I guess that that really is reflected in the art. And the art is very, very good in this game. Um, it's all full color. It didn't it was not like that in first edition, uh, and it is just it is an amazing product. I cannot recommend this enough. Um, you just have to read it to understand what I'm talking about when I say that they have that this game is fast, it is sexy, and it is scary. And uh, they have the clans are just awesome now. The covenants are just awesome now. Uh, they fixed the Carthians, which I thought, as they were presented in first edition Requiem, uh, the core book, were just stupid. They were boring. They were social democrats. That was it. There was nothing revolutionary, nothing scary about them. Uh, but this, uh, the Carthians in this game are much more influenced by, uh, you know, the, the radical uh, left anarchist tradition, uh, the, uh, you know, communist revolutionaries, uh, so for me, they're the most e <laughs> they're the most evil covenant by <laughs> by definition. <laughs> um, they've taken uh, even the covenants that I thought were brilliant, like uh, the Ordo Dracul and the Lancaea Sanctum. They've refined those, and they're a little bit different, but they're they're super. They're just they're awesome now. Um, and the Circle of the Crone. Oh my God, I did not like the Circle of the Crone in the first in the first game. Um, I used them as antagonists. Uh, I didn't really get them, I guess. Uh, they were, you know, they're the kind of pagan uh, vampires, I guess. The way it's presented in uh, in this, this edition is just awesome. It blew my mind. It made me immediately want to play a character in the Circle of the Crone. It was so good. Um, and the way this book is written, it's very active. Uh, whereas the first edition was very much like, this is information, it's being presented to you, and yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, the, in comparison, that's how it sounds, in comparison to the way it is written in this, because this game is sexy and fast and and scary, and it's full of these little bits of fiction um, that uh, demonstrating, just, you know, really demonstrating the feel of the game. Uh, it is awesome. If I had uh, a criticism of this game, I guess this is my review of Blood and Smoke. I'm not going to do another one after this. Uh, I might, but I guess if I had a criticism of this book, uh, it is the thing that's on the cover, the title, The Strix Chronicle. Um, the Strix are an interesting antagonist, but they, it doesn't, I would hesitate to see, say that this, this feels tacked on, because what is in the, <laughs> the chapter about the Strix in this game is very good. Um, but they don't really fit 
for me as as it's not what this game is about. The game is about the corruption of the self. It's about uh, fighting to retain your humanity uh, or becoming something different uh, as a result of not doing that. Uh, it's about the backstabbing. It's about the, the gothic corruption. Uh, and the Strix just seem like kind of a boogeyman. Um, and they can be a very scary boogeyman. Uh, but I don't and I don't see myself using the Strix as uh, being like this like city threatening uh, threat. You know, they're the ones uh, they're pulling the strings in the background, and uh, you you know you you don't know who to trust. Um, I don't know. I don't see that as being something I. It's just not something I'm going to use. Uh, I will use the Strix in my games, but uh, not. I don't. I don't think as as intended. This adding the Strix into the game uh, was a result of I think they first appeared in Requiem for Rome and also I think after that Damnation City. Uh, I never read Damnation City, the one book I always wanted that I never got. Um, I did read Requiem for Rome and they they fit in Requiem for Rome, but uh, they were inserted into this this setting as a way to give a kind of uh, a default set of antagonists, a default not meta plot but something. Um, more th to to focus this down it can still be a sandbox but there's also this other element of like okay but here's something for you guys who want uh a little bit more lore a little bit uh more of a, of a direction from the outset we're gonna uh, we'll put these in here and i don't like that <laughs> that's just me that's that's my main criticism of it but this game i love games where the mechanics support storytelling where the mechanics are what uh, help you build a more interesting character. And in that respect, this mops the floor with Masquerade. It mops the floor with Masquerade, it just, in every way. <laughs> um, the way that there's, there's suggestions for building your coterie of vampires uh, as a group uh, that are just awesome. Uh, that you can basically create an entire city's worth of plot lines. Uh, when building your characters. It's not something I'm going to do because that takes an enormous amount of time, something I don't really have, uh, but it's, a, it's fucking cool. It is really, really cool. Um, the touchstone system is awesome. The, the adjustments to humanity are awesome. And they have finally, finally retooled all of the disciplines in this game uh, and totally distinguished them from Masquerade. Animalism is like now the raddest power Ever, I always thought animalism was like kind of cool and in, in a in a way in Masquerade, but not something I ever wanted to really invest in in my character. Animalism is is awesome. It's rad. There's no two ways around it. Uh, the the way that they redid uh, that they they've tweaked Protean, the way that they fixed all of the physical disciplines. Finally, oh my God, they fixed the physical disciplines and they're awesome. Every single discipline in this game is scary. Uh, and they, I mean, they fixed aspects. Uh, they, everything about this game is awesome. They took one of my favorite things from from Requiem uh, First Edition, and also something I hated simultaneously: the Predator's Taint. It was this idea that uh, vampires intuitively know you can feel the presence of another vampire, and if they're of a stronger blood potency than you, uh, they are meaning that they're an older, stronger predator than you. Then you, it would trigger this like flight response. You would want to run away. Uh, if you were of equal blood potency, you know, it would cause you, like, almost a frenzy. You know, it was like you'd have these territorial disputes. Uh, it was an interesting idea, but in practice it made it very difficult uh, to use that uh, that mechanic. It was, it was kind of fucked up. It was just not a very good mechanic uh, in the game. They took that and they made it awesome in this game. They made it so fucking good. Uh, because now it's it's less about feeling like this other mystical presence, but it's about seeing another person and recognizing the signs of another predator, seeing the way that you know their their shallow breath, the way they move, the way they're talking to someone. You can immediately know that that is another vampire, and you can choose. Uh, all of the disciplines are powered by the beast. It's and it's about uh, you know tapping into the beast and the beast. Uh, exerting an influence on the physical world. Well, you can do that with your predatory aura. You can lash out with your beast and challenge other vampires uh, in in different ways. You can challenge them uh, with with seduction. Uh, you can challenge them to you know trying to provoke a flight response or provoke them to frenzy. Um, and they and you know they get to counter challenge and resist. And what's awesome is you can lash out and use this against human beings. And you uh, to, uh, to to influence human beings just by being a vampire. They completely fixed all of the, the clan weaknesses. They are so 
well defined in this version. Uh, they're they're so good. I will I will not have to house rule any of those either. Uh, it is it is so good. Um, and the addition uh, of conditions since the God Machine Chronicle uh, has been just awesome. Uh, it's an easy way to keep track of effects. Uh, and I actually something I never thought I would do. Uh, I went out and bought the condition cards for Requiem. I will be right back because I grabbed those. Um, the condition cards, a lot of people, I can already feel <laughs> main man, you know, grinding his teeth uh, as I talk about buying condition cards for a video game, or for a, for a role-playing game. It's like adding miniatures to your game. It's not like adding miniatures. It's an effective and easy way to keep track of conditions. If, uh, you know, someone lashes out against you and, uh, you know, with, with their lustful uh, predatory aura, uh, their seductive aura, you gain the Wanton Condition, and this card you give to the player, and the player just puts it down, they read it, and it tells them everything they need to know about what this condition is imposing, what effect has, uh, has happened to them, and how to roleplay that uh, effectively afterwards. Um, it also gives you, uh, you know, information, possible sources um, from uh, how you could have uh, attained this condition, how you can overcome it. It gives you a way to role play your way out of having this condition and uh, whether or not you get a beat from it. And this is like, this is just awesome. They, the experience system in Blood and Smoke is the best I have seen in any game I've ever come, come across. Uh, because it, in order to gain beats uh, towards experience, you, it's five beats equals one experience point. And now when you wanna upgrade your character's statistics, it's no more like, okay, I want to update, uh, I want to upgrade my, my discipline, so it's my current rating times four, it, uh, and that's how much experience uh, points I need to get. It's not that at all. They each have a set rating. It's like four experience to, uh, you know, raise your an attribute, three experience to uh, raise a discipline, uh, things along those lines. Um, and the way you gain beats is by accomplishing specific role-playing uh, goals. Um, anytime that you, you know, take health all the way out to, you know, one of your rightmost health boxes in this game, anytime you take that much damage, you gain a beat. Um, anytime you face a breaking point, uh, you know, like a humanity roll, you take a beat. Anytime that you make uh, progress towards one of your aspirations, which is another thing in character creation, you get to write down, and these are basically cues to your storyteller, you get to help choose what direction the game goes in. You can choose a goal like, you know what? I really want my character to uh, have like a forbidden love in this game. Um, anytime you make progress towards making that goal a reality in game, you gain a beat. Uh, you can uh, choose to have these black box scenes with your touchstone where it kind of gives you a spotlight. Uh, it's a little bit like having a soliloquy scene in, in within the Ring of Fire. Hi guys, yeah, sorry, this is my cat. There she is. <laughs> uh, in which you get the spotlight, and it's a it's a scene where you get to have a kind of a really emotional uh, scene, whether whether you're fighting with your with your touchstone or uh, you know whether it's not that they're being put in danger. It's really more about the uh, them reminding you of your humanity. You gain a beat from that. Um, you can uh, you get beats in, in a variety of ways. Every time you earn five beats, you get one experience point. And the way you get beats is by having an awesome story, and by and it gives you specific ways in which you gain experience, uh, and that takes actually a lot of the heavy lifting off of uh, the storyteller. And in my opinion, this is something I'm very bad at. As my players, my within the Ring of Fire game will tell you, uh, I'm very bad about giving experience out. Uh, uh, they're always like reminding me right before we play, like, "Hey, you didn't give us X XP after the last session." I'm like, "Oh fuck, you're right." And I and I sit there and I try and figure out, okay, well, let's judge the soliloquies, let's judge this. Um, and granted, it would be easier if I did that right after the session as opposed to, you know, two weeks later. Uh, but it's still like, this just gives me an easy way. Like, no, that's how you got, you got an experience. You know, you got an experience point. I don't have to try and subjectively decide at the end of a session, you know, what would it be worth to give the players this time? Uh, you earn it. You earn it through your role play in this game. And that's awesome. And that makes this game better than Masquerade. It is better, definitively, forever. This is the answer. Blood and Smoke is the best game. Condition cards are awesome. They help so much. They make it so simplified. Uh, and it's also, in, this is a way too that like, I'm not good at writing mechanics in my opinion. I've always been very, well, I've never tried it. Uh, I've always felt that it would be 
difficult to come up with rules without much inspiration. But the condition system, when I look at this, I'm like, no, I can come up with conditions. I can do this, you know, and I and I can come up with cool fucking ways to instigate these things, uh, and they are they are awesome. Um, I definitely, if you get blood and smoke, spend the ten bucks or whatever to get condition cards. These things are awesome. You can get it with a little deck box as well. Uh, I also went ahead and got the God Machine Chronicle conditions as well. Uh, I don't have the God Machine Chronicle in a physical form yet. I will at some point, but I'm also kind of waiting to see what they do with the second edition on that one. Um, but Blood and Smoke by far is one of the best role-playing games I've ever come across. The artwork is amazing. It helps to convey the, the new feel of this game. This game is highly sexualized. There is, it is very sexy, uh, and that's a good thing in my opinion. Uh, it tells the story of vampirism. Um, sorry, I'm watching the clock right now. Um, and uh, it's something that, uh, this is something that actually kind of bothers me as, as a tangent. Uh, uh, is people when they talk about you know role playing games you know you have the you know the the booby armor and the you know the armor bikinis and things like that for women and women being very sexualized in in uh, in role playing games and it goes for men too they all look like he men and everything uh, and a lot of people get really pissed off and annoyed by that and it doesn't fucking bother me because this is fantasy and I'm sorry I like tits and <laughs> I like. <laughs> And I like the idea that you get to play these larger-than-life characters. And there's nothing wrong with sexualization, in my opinion. And, so, and sexualization, by the way, is something that occurs in the mind. It has everything to do with context. Uh, there's nothing inherent about, uh, you know, any part of the body or any any drawing or picture that, that you know, uh, that that is sexual. That sexualization occurs in your mind. Um, at any rate... This game is very sexy. The context is very sexy, and I love it. I think it's great. This is a very, this is a mature, this is an adult game. This is not a game for kids at all, uh, and it really came across in this game. And I, and I thank uh, Onyx Path for for doing that. Um, I, it's not exploitative in any way. If if that's what people are thinking, I'm saying it's not exploitative in any, in any way. But it is explicit, uh, and it serves the game. It really, really does. Uh, so I, I cannot wait to play this game. I cannot wait to play this game. Uh, and there you have it. I have forever solved this debate. There can be no more debate because I have told you that Blood and Smoke, Vampire the Requiem 2nd Edition, is a better game definitively than Vampire the Masquerade. Both are good. And I used to be on the fence. I was on the fence for ten for a decade. I was on the fence about this. No longer. The scales have been tipped. Thank you very much, Rose Bailey, for developing this game. Dave Hill for doing so much work and so much writing for it. And everybody else that made it, because this is one of my favorite RPG products to have ever been made. It is it is awesome. It is a triumph. And I cannot wait to play it. Um, it is it is absolutely brilliant. So inspiring and so scary. And that's it. That's the answer. Apples are better than oranges. <laughs>